This meeting is being recorded, everyone. Um, so welcome. Uh, thank you so much for being here. Um, this is our second Humanitarian Engineering and Science and Masters in Environmental Management Colloquium. Um, my name is Elizabeth Reddy, and I want to welcome all of you um, <clears throat> kind of for the team from the Colorado School of Mines and Western Colorado University. Um, so we have an amazing speaker tonight, um, very different than our last speaker, um, thankfully. Uh, that's Dr. Christopher Kasky. And Chris is an alumnus uh, and former research assistant professor from Colorado School of Mines. Um, he's also done work with Western. So he really kind of unites our, our he's a, like a, a kind of a bridge between our two programs. Um, <clears throat> and he's been doing some fascinating work and in making waves in innovative humanitarian engineering, science, and business um, with his company, Delta Brick and Climate Company. So he's a board member of the Western Slope Conservation Center, and he has re been a researcher at NRAL. He's consulted as a material scientist and consulted, I'm not quite sure what the, what the um, contractual organization, like, organization is, but consulted as a, mount, um, a mountain guide as well, would you say? I don't know if I consulted, but I, I have I have taken people into the mountains and then been like, oh no, you got a hernia and dealt with that. Well, he's guided as a mountain guide under sounds like some intense situations. Um, so we're really lucky to have um, Dr. Kasky here to speak with us about sustainable ceramics, about the North Fork Valley, and more broadly about what humanitarian engineering and science can look like. Um, so. As, our, as in our previous, um, our previous colloquium, what we're gonna do is as following, Dr. Kasky is gonna, is gonna speak and talk with us about his work and his observations. Um, I'm gonna be in charge of dealing with tech stuff. So if you have any technical issues, if you can't see the screen, um, if you get kicked out, if you have Zoom problems, just chat me um, or put, a note just in general in the chat. I'll be monitoring that. Um, <laughs> I guess I am the bouncer. I'm more of the welcomer. I'm more of the welcome committee than the bouncer, I would like to say, but I'm also the bouncer if necessary. Um, throughout the talk, uh, Dr. Kasky has let me know that he would welcome any questions as he goes. But if something just comes up, if something rings a bell and you want to mark it for later, if you think, oh, I don't want to jump in, but here's an idea, put it in the chat. I'm gonna be tracking what's in the chat and I'm gonna come back to it later during a, a sort of more formal question and answer uh, section at the end. Um, so yeah, please, please use the chat. I'll keep an eye on that. And uh, Dr. Kasky will just do his thing. Um, so I will also keep an eye on the, um, on the folks who are coming in and be admitting people. Um, with that, I think we have our introduction and our a little housekeeping taken care of. Um, Chris, thank you so much for being here and speaking with us. We're so um, happy to have you and your perspective and, and we're honored that you can, you can share your experiences with us. Um, so I'm gonna let you take it away. Thanks, yeah, it's wonderful to be here and, and thank you all for zooming in. It's uh, good times in COVID world. I will share my screen now. Here. Nope, nope. How are we doing? Can we see it? All right, great. So as Dr. Reddy said, please do interrupt me if you want to, and otherwise just questions to the chat and we'll, we'll get them in the end. So I titled this talk, Problems We've Been Ignoring, uh, and, and we'll get towards that at the end. But, but my goal is to show a chronology of this particular project, which is Delta Brick and Climate Company. And that may or may not be humanitarian engineering or science, depending on y'all's definition of it, but it certainly has angles of that. Um, and I'm just going to bounce somewhat erratically from like high level. I think I learned this lesson to like, ooh, let's get like nitty gritty because I think there's a good audience 
hopefully, hopefully some of you guys will, will like the detailed science, but you know, you can tune it out if you uh, want to. And then part of the problems are the challenges that this particular project is facing, but I can get a little bit myopic about that. And so please do like uh, mock me somehow if I am just whining about things. And that I put that in there because there's one of the problems that we're not talking about specifically is the sort of like cult of the entrepreneur where we think like, oh yeah, one, one person can solve something. And it's like, I don't think that's really true. So um, moving on. The first problem is that, is that we have climate change, right? And Americans all agree that it is bad. This came from Pew Research, where we have a supermajority of people in the U.S. saying that global climate change is a ma major threat to the well-being of the United States. And why aren't we actually working on it? And one problem is that our system is not representative of the majority of people and what we want and what would be good for us, especially um, in the future for younger folks. So that's a problem. I guess we're maybe we're not ignoring it, but uh, we know that climate change is bad and we've been breathing smoke from wildfires recently. Uh, I made this slide originally before the wildfires of this year. And this is the floods from 2013 outside of Longmont or so. And that's like, just a reminder that climate change is, is broadly terrible and we can experience different parts of it. So we all know that CO2 is the main culprit. Most of us also know that methane is there and that it's 80 something times worse depending on how you count on a per ton basis. I would argue that we can still fix climate change and that we need to try. And again, this project is going for that and, and is not the whole solution by, by any means. So focusing specifically on methane, methane is a hydrocarbon. It is, you know, occurs geologically. People on this call could explain it better than I can, but um, it leaks out over time, right? Methane is lighter than air. And if a gas bearing formation is in contact with the surface, uh, methane will bubble out. So this is a lake, specifically Paonia Reservoir, with ice on it that failed to freeze because bubbles kept coming out over and over. Um, that is either from coal beneath the uh, sediment here, which would make that coal bed methane, or it was from gas bearing members above or below the coal. Uh, now, if you mine the coal, it will cause methane to leak out much, much faster. So one, if there's methane in the coal here or below or above, that is a threat to the safety of coal miners and the canary in the coal mine expression came because uh, miners would carry birds down that would die from methane faster than than the miners would and the so that's vented for miner safety they'll go out on the surface and pump that out but um the way coal is actually mined in underground mines is very cool and i'm still trying to get uh, get a tour of coal mines but like you know, the humanitarian aspect is an issue. The, um, we have these big machines called long wall miners and they have these giant knuckles that go back and forth along a track that might be 300 feet long, uh, scraping out coal. And then that machine has big hydraulics that hold up the ceiling and, is, and then armor behind it because the mountain collapses after the miner works its way through. And um, wait for it. So that's crazy, first of all. But the uh, second of all, any gas that was in the remaining coal or the rock above and below is much closer to atmosphere now because that geology breaks up and there's more porosity and the gas escapes. So looking at that one more time in cartoon version, you see the long wall miner proceeding through a seam of coal and a uh, vent facilities on the surface where they've drilled down into the next seam that's going to get mined or next part of the seam and pump the gas out of there. Now depending on the mining configuration they'll either pump before or after the machine goes through but that's neither here nor there for our purposes. Mostly 
the gas is coming out much faster now that mining has occurred. And this continues for decades afterwards from as the, as the mountain continues to collapse. So methane being lighter than air is then gonna go up. It's gonna go out those old boreholes. It's gonna go out portals if they were uphill and it's gonna find gaps and cracks from methane settling. So there's almost certainly methane venting out of this crack when I was up there, but I didn't have my detector with me. Um, the quality is too poor to use as natural gas and there's not much market for electricity. So mostly we want to burn this one way or another for climate benefit. Just light it on fire, turn it into CO2, and then that's way better. One of the few times you'll hear an environmentalist say, let's get some machines on the hill and light some stuff on fire. Uh, but we do occasionally say that. So the our uh, Composition of this gas is mostly methane, or you could consider it methane-rich natural gas. It does have higher hydrocarbons like ethane and propane in it. And um, all of those things, when they react with the atmosphere, cause uh, respiratory hazards like smog and ground level ozone. Um, there's hexane and benzene in here in small quantities, but because this mining region is releasing millions of cubic feet per day, um, you're looking at what really is a slow motion oil spill if you are trying to be alarmist. And depending on the audience, I'll, I'll focus on that or not. Um, one more photograph for emphasis is this is a mine that closed in the 80s and you can see these steaming vents coming from the surface above the mine. Um, those, those I have been up to with the detector and they have methane in them. There's probably some coal smoldering down there too, which is bringing out the water vapor so, so you can see it more readily. Now, this project came about when I was at School of Mines on faculty. The Delta County and Gunnison County got together with the Hickenlooper administration to make a stakeholder working group. They said, um, Let's get the mines together, let's get the regulators together, conservation groups and, and other experts for what they call the North Fork Coal Mine Methane Working Group. Just can we figure out something to do with this to either keep it out of the air, maybe make some economic activity, who knows. Uh, as that was going on, I put forward this Delta Brick project and got sponsored by the state to go through um, the Ice Lab Accelerator at Western. Is that still what it's called? Someone chime in if they know. Is it still called Ice Lab? It's the, it still exists. Yes, it is. Innovation, creativity, entrepreneurship. Okay, excellent. So, um, so that took me to Western, which was wonderful. Now, the stakeholders from the methane side, if you want to do a project, obviously the mine is one of the stakeholders. Bureau of Land Management is one of them. They certainly own the coal and they are not clear with themselves whether or not they own and lease the gas component of the coal. Um, CDPHE is important also, uh, especially the Air Quality Control Commission. Whoever owns the surface is important. Whoever owns the subsurface mineral rights is important. Uh, the Oil and Gas Conservation Commission at the state level you got to talk to them, but they, they don't really like coal mine methane. And then, of course, the Division of Reclamation, Mining, and Safety is the state entity that, uh, that regulates the end of life for the mine surface. And because the methane leaks out for decades, they are relevant. So looking at this area again, now we were talking just before this call about where, in fact, is Paonia. That's a great question. So even where is Somerset is, a, is an even more difficult question, but we're out in Delta County, which is uh, Western Colorado, not all the way to Utah, but about in the middle north south. If you go up north on Highway 133, you'll get to Carbondale, about 45 minutes from, from the lake here. Paonia's down here. That takes you to Delta. From Delta, you can go north to Grand Junction or south to Montrose. So, this mining area uh, has been mined for over 100 years. There's been over 300 coal mines. About 30 of them have been properly huge. Most were quite small. But the, the 
dots that you see in this satellite image are um, the vent pads. So that's where they drilled down into the coal seam. So they've, they've mined out square miles and the scale bar down here is, is a mile or two. Um, so a lot of coal has been mined, a lot of gas is coming out. It is, as we said, a strong greenhouse gas, but if you burn it, which is what we wanna do for climate benefit, then we have a high quality heat source. And the easiest, the easiest material science that I am aware of is making pottery, which is you just need some clay and some heat and like, let's get going. So Paonia State Park is, um, contains Paonia Reservoir and all of that water is earmarked for irrigation. So down here, this valley has always been known for its agriculture and its coal. And you know, coal is declining. Agriculture, we're trying to do agro-tourism. We're up to like 13 wineries, I think. So come do some wine tasting. Um, and, and we have a pretty high concentration of organic farms, some of which it might be the highest concentration. People claim that, I'm not sure. Um, it just so happens that this sediment that is clogging up the reservoir and reducing irrigation storage is a high quality material. So we need that storage because as climate change pushes the, the melting earlier, we want to hold that water uh, for the season. And then, of course, summer is getting longer and hotter, so we need more water. But we've lost about a quarter of the storage in that reservoir. They built the reservoir in the 60s. And what you're looking at here is what's called the outlet works, which is the bathtub drain at the bottom of the pond. Um, but it's held off the ground on that tower because they knew some sediment was coming in. This is a person for scale. And then the dam is, is out here out of sight. So this would ordinarily be under 100 or 200 feet of water. Uh, in 2014, they drained the lake to do maintenance because the outlet works, this is the same structure, was totally clogged. And the sediment had come all the way up and was plugging the gates. And, and that's no good. So they drained it, scraped it away but we've had, they've had 70 feet of high quality clay material deposited in that part of the reservoir. And then of course it goes back for miles. So if you want to um, do anything in the reservoir, you have a stakeholder issue as well. And that is, it's in a state park, but that state entity overlays federal land. So the surface owner is Bureau of Reclamation and Anytime they built a dam, they would stand up a water conservancy district, which is a semi-governmental nonprofit. So the North Fork Water Conservancy District is in charge of the dam, but they are just like four people and only one of them is paid a few hours a week. So they contract the management to Fire Mountain Canal and Reservoir Company, which actually has a bigger budget. Um, and if you want to disturb a water of the United States, the NEPA process, National Environmental Policy Act, is administered by the Army Corps of Engineers. And they're like, is that a wetland? Because you need a permit if it's a wetland. I'm like, I don't know, it's a reservoir bottom. Um, Division of Reclamation, Mining and Safety, again comes out. Um, Colorado Department of Transportation, and then this is all in Gunnison County. So this DRMS, they, they get a special shout out because I asked them, I was like, all right, I'm digging a hole is this hole a mine and does it need a mining permit? And they're like, yes, it is a mine and it does need a mining permit. And I'm like, but it's just a, a mud hole. So anyway, um, this, this joke is for a minority of, of the audience here, but the mine has an official legal name because they required me to come up with something. And that is the two sheep for one brick mine. Moving on. Um, you know, there's also just the public as, as people, who are stakeholders and they'll ask things like how loud will the factory be are there any heavy metals in the sediment how many trucks will you be running does tapping into these coal mine constitute fracking and and what is coming up out of the exhaust so so moving from that sort of high level we got to talk to the public concern to a pretty nitty-gritty x-ray diffraction um what we see in the sediment is uh, various quartz minerals or, or quartz, various clay minerals. 
and a little bit of iron oxide, titanium dioxide, et cetera. Now, looking at the mica, we have a wee touch of fluorine, which if you roast up fluorine in a reducing atmosphere, you can expect hydrogen fluoride emissions maybe. So that's where the Air Quality Control Commission comes in because that one's not the best. Um, but are there heavy metals? I don't know. Manganese is kind of heavy. Iron's kind of heavy. Um, certainly not, not toxic if you're just uh, walking around on it. So how do you make brick? It's, it's pretty easy. Brick or tile or patio pavers. One is you got to go get the mud. So after you've done your stakeholder work, you can go fill up a dump trailer with mud. You want to mix that up to uh, whatever water content and particle size distribution uh, without hurting your hands. This is on our, our mixer. Is it just a delightful graphic? Um, and then you, you extrude. So what we have is a machine called an extruder, which is a big auger screw, and it just pushes the mud out of whatever opening we put on the end of it. So in this case, it's a thin rectangular opening, which pushes out um, a lot of ribbon. We then straight up use a cookie cutter to punch that ribbon into whatever shape we want. We then dry that tile, fire that tile. So the goal is getting to a high enough temperature where stuff is just gonna fuse together. And when I say stuff, I mean the clay particles. They're gonna very slightly melt on the surface and, and have a fusion between adjacent particles. So going back to this extruder here, this, pipe is pumping air out of the clay so that we have fewer, less air in the clay, which means we have more nearest neighbors between our clay particles, which means we can have a stronger fused network when they all melt together. Um, fire tile, great. Then when it fires up, the iron oxide color really comes through. You can then glaze it just with a normal pottery glaze. We fire that again, this time in an electric kiln, and we come up with some nice things like this. So these were our first two installations uh, at a coffee shop in Paonia and at a home in Paonia. Um, that's about the limit of straight product marketing that I'll do. We appreciate you guys watching. Um, for the engineers in the audience, we can have a flow chart of what's happening. Starts with sediment. Coal mine methane used to fire the kiln, and then we just want to burn it on the side, then also generate some electricity for our electric kiln. So right now we are using clay out of the reservoir, but we have not yet caused our factory to run on coal mine methane. Our factory is just on regular grid gas. Uh, material science, is it interesting? Maybe. So we talked about burning out the... <laughs> <laughs> we, we talked we talked about burning out the um you know there's carbon and sulfur in there and and possibly hydrogen fluoride so this particular chart is thermogravimetric analysis which is a very precise scale in a high temperature furnace and it's watching the mass change in green so it's watching mass drop as material burns out of the clay body so you're losing water obviously um, so, so here's a water peak just for like, it's never fully dry. Here's a water peak for some of these minerals are actually hydrated. You're burning out CO2. Um, this is like leaves, decayed leaves and fish poop. And then, you're, and then you're burning out CO2 again. And this is a carbonate decomposition. And then we have sulfur coming out of sulfur oxide as well. So to get this CO2 out, we have to get oxygen into the clay body, react it with CO2 and back out. So we need some level of porosity for that gas exchange, but we want a minimum porosity because we need those nearest neighbor agreements so that they can fuse together and be extra strong. And of course, in the final product, porosity is going to soak up water and, and cause freeze thaw if the application is outdoors. So we kind of have this balance between we want porosity originally, and then we want that all to seal up at the end. Um, this is an experiment that we did to see how we were burning out. And uh, we did a series where there was different temperatures that we held at and different lengths of time to 
watch. So, so what's happened here is the oxygen has worked its way in, reacted, gone back out, and we stopped the firing at different times to see here's where there is still visible carbon, and then that shrinks and shrinks. So we don't, we don't need to eliminate this. This is called a black heart uh, because the, the brick industry is somewhat metal. But we don't need to eliminate black hearts because, the, because it's okay. It doesn't hurt anything unless we get to a temperature where the clay body has sealed up and lost its porosity, but we're still generating volatile materials from the inside of the brick, and then it'll puff up like a loaf of bread. So we have some various, um, we have some bricks that are like this big, and it's like, that's not, that's not how it's supposed to be. So I would submit that material science is in fact interesting. And we have had in COVID times to adapt from saying, we really, we really want to be a paver business because there's so much gas and there's so much clay that if we can just sell by the pallet, then we can have the impact that we want. But that's relatively low margin. So we've sort of had to move up into tile where we're, we're using less energy, we're using less material, but we're selling at a higher margin and even to custom tile. So these little saddle shapes were specified by a homeowner in a resort town. And that's, that's good for us from a money standpoint, but it's not particularly useful from a um, impact standpoint. You know, the farms in the area aren't going to miss that quantity of sediment. So at this point, I like to acknowledge my white dudeness um, and ask the question, what do you need to start a project like this? Um, Obviously, you need to have a reasonable idea and, and some hard work and some technical knowledge, um, which, which you all at Mines and Western uh, certainly have these two middle ones. But this project wouldn't have gone anywhere if my parents weren't wealthy because they lent me some money to like do the stakeholder work and put a deposit on a, not a deposit, a down payment, a down payment on a lease for some commercial space. And that's not open to everyone. And so in that 60% of Americans who care about climate change, um, a whole bunch of them can't do anything other than vote, sometimes not even that. But um, this sort of thing is not accessible to everyone. And I will proceed to make fun of investors because they are sort of the gatekeepers in a lot of these situations. So these are, these are things that I have really heard and how I have interpreted them. So you will find this on investor websites. They say, we want to be the first money in after the friends and family round, which means we want to invest in rich kids. Um, if you go try to get a loan, you might hear, let's circle back whenever COVID is over. I really did hear that. That was back in March. And I was like, come on. I really want a bigger kiln, um, which is, but that's really a privilege filter too, right? Like if I'm still around like this time next year or whenever COVID is over, according to this guy, um, then I'll be like loanable, which is, which is ridiculous. Um, favorite one that I've ever received. And this was one of those, um, it was an email that's like, you got to make a username and password to view this secure document that we've sent you. And all it said was, we're not giving you a loan uh, due to insuff insufficient personal liquidity, which just means you're not, not rich enough. Sorry. So, um, you know, the systems are set up to benefit wealthy people because they're set up by wealthy people. And as someone with like a ton of privilege, I'm able to access just a little bit of that but I'm still not, you know, I'm still not able to just fully go, go build out a methane capture project on a coal mine because I couldn't raise that much money. Um, also, so investors will say that we want to see you like with some revenue and a minimum viable product out there. But really, that means like you really have to spend a couple hundred thousand dollars before doing that. And uh, someone from Ford X, which is Ford Motor Company's internal accelerator. He said for even a software product, you're at half a million dollars. Um, and so that's just something to keep in mind for those of you looking at entrepreneurship is there's just, the barriers really are high and people will like, 
people talk to you and like check out your ideas, but they're not, um, you, 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 they're not, they're not, it's not a charity. They're not here to help really. So the problems that I've talked about so far that I think as a society, we are unfortunately ignoring are our climate change. The fact that we have, uh, unrepresentative systems that mean we we can't work on this. Uh, reservoir sedimentation is, is known throughout the West as just a problem, but not one with solutions. Um, and then, and then real inequality that both leads to that anti-democratic stuff and, um, and inequality in business. So I don't think that I am solving them. And one version of this talk, I just try to be really inspirational and say like, yeah, we can do it. Um, but the, you know, really, we're just going to use a small percentage of the gas that's, that's leaking out of our area and, um, and only a small amount of the sediment. So fun fact, which I didn't say earlier, Paonia Dam is built on a creek named Muddy Creek and Muddy Creek brings down just an enormous amount of sediment every year. Um, so we'd have to be a, a truly large brick factory to use to even half of that. But those, those big brick factories are outside of, of big cities like Houston that are growing rapidly. So, um, and, you know, I'm aware of the, of the race aspect of this. And it, it happens that all three of my employees are white dudes. And my excuse is, well, before I was going, it was like, who can I pay to, to dig some mud with me? And then those, those sort of people stuck around and, and our employees now. So anyway, that's, that's, that, that's my ego check. Um, but I do enjoy making fun of investors and will continue to do so. The conclusions that I have is this is, um, so, so we got these two problems and we can point them at each other to create some, so, some solutions, but the, these specific two problems being the gas and the coal, we're not doing anything about democracy or the gas and the sediment. Um, but this is not a story of like some entrepreneur solving some stuff and you do need a ton of privilege to get to where I'm at. I um, want to thank a bunch of people. The water stakeholders have been really good. Vessels Carbon Solutions is a private company that owns gas rights that we will be tapping into. Uh, we have funding from the Department of Public Health and Environment, Colorado Water Conservation Board, Delta County, Gunnison County, and the State Department of Local Affairs. Uh, and the very first bricks that I made when I got that lease on the new factory turned out like this. So we had a lot of problems, including that gas volatilization issue. Uh, that's it for now. I will take any questions. Everybody, I'm watching the chat, so I'll invite you to throw in questions or voice them if you like. Um, maybe while you're thinking about what questions you might like to ask Dr. Kasky, we could um, start with some of the questions that have circulated in the chat already. Um, I'm particularly interested. Let's start with, um, I think let's start with a technical mining question because um, it's worth asking. So do you use a uh, cutter head dredge in water or excavator in, in, in dry? Um, and do you have any concerns with the aquatic environment? We we use it well last year we so when the water's up we we don't touch it because we don't think that we're at the volume that justifies a dredge though someone on this call could probably inform me of like how small a dredge you can have to make it cost effective so last last time the water was down we did not have all of our permits so uh, we had enough permits to go get mud by hand, but not to operate equipment in the reservoir. So we just did five gallon buckets and filled that dump trailer that way. And then we stockpiled enough until now when we almost have all of our permits and our current, our current proposal says that we will use uh, like a small excavator or a skid steer with a, with a little dump loader and like 10 yard dump trucks. So dry, when it's dry, only going down um, one to four feet. Four feet is my floor 
according to my permit, but the the top layer of of clay is is, is really only 24 inches deep. So we'll we'll stop there. But we are concerned. This little picture is is a small creek that comes in and cuts through the alluvium and these are all willows so this is the you know this is under 20 feet of water midsummer but um but this is a real ecosystem and it may or may not be a wetland according to some definitions but it is a real ecosystem so we are concerned and i think i've said enough on that but um we'd love to hear more uh from from someone who knows more so that question i should say was from um robin bullock um, I have another question uh, that actually is a really good segue um, from Ricardo Vasquez, who asks um, if you've conducted life cycle analyses to evaluate environmental impacts, and if so, how did you go about doing it, um, and what did you find? So we have not, no, so short answer is no, and we just kind of say a little bit hand-waving, these are both problems, so it must be good the really if you're shipping more than 500 miles it's probably not good that's the rule of thumb for what is what is a green building material is shipped 500 miles um the i would say we certainly need to for example have scrubbers on our smokestacks once we get to any scale because we will be, you know, you saw a lot of sulfur coming out. Um, hydrogen fluoride is a concern. So we've not done a formal life cycle analysis and, and we probably should. Um, just as a follow-up to that, um, could you talk about what motivated your, um, your decision to maybe hold off on that? Because it sounds as if, you know, a formal life cycle analysis is something that's in the cards, but maybe wasn't practical or wasn't, um, yeah wasn't required at the stages you've been at yeah i would say i i have not just there was not a time when i was like no life cycle analysis and this is the first time i've really been thinking about it so the um uh, yeah i think it i think it ought to be done Okay, let's see, what else can we, um, kind of on that note, I wonder if we could talk a little bit about stakeholder analysis and stakeholder engagement. Um, so you spoke a little bit about some very fascinating um, stakeholders, like um, some ambiguous stakeholders, stakeholders that kind of identified themselves as owners or kind of had the bandwidth to talk to you. Um, but those were largely like in um, government and kind of regulatory agencies. Um, so Jessica Smith asked, what kind of stakeholder work um, do you use to engage with public? So what do you think is, is necessary for this kind of work, maybe beyond um, government agencies? Yeah, that's a great question. The, you know, for our permits, we do what is required, which is putting a legalese posting in the newspaper. And for uh, for other folks, this, this sort of thing, right? You guys aren't here in the Valley. Um, but I gave a talk at the library that was about this project that was pre COVID. And my goal is just to be super transparent. Like I put hydrogen fluoride on that slide because it's like, it's going to be recorded and someone's going to, uh, someone's going to think about it and someone's going to be concerned and it's better. It's better if I've been talking about it, I think. So the, there's not a formal stakeholder plan. That very first grant that I got was partially just stakeholder work. You know, go, go call up the county, go call up the coal mines, go call up um, whoever. But for, for like this town, Paonia, other than trying to be vocal and, and trying to be transparent, there's, there's not a formal plan. Um, sorry, I'm collecting other kinds of um, questions here. So um, when you think about uh, larger tile and, and clay manufacturers, do you think there's any way they can incorporate leaking methane into their production processes, kind of like you've done from the start? 
So how do we motivate companies that might already be big um, to switch to using like this form of, of energy for, for plants? Are there um, kinds of uh, geographic um, concerns or considerations? Might this be more applicable for some people than others? This is a question from Mia Gazzetti. Yeah, so on the methane side, I'm not aware of any manufacturers in the United States doing this with waste methane from coal mines. There is at least one that uses landfill gas, which is an analogous decomposition product that's mostly methane and CO2. And there's some that sub in some biogas. So that's where you have a, you know, swampy reactor that's that's making methane and the motivation is difficult right energy is extremely inexpensive like i've got some i've got a pretty big gas kiln and we pay like a hundred dollars a month in gas and so there's not this wouldn't be motivated from pure economics to say oh you could have free gas if you just did this difficult set of engineering that that is going to cost a bunch of money up front but then it'll be free that doesn't pencil out from a business standpoint so the motivation needs to be um something like a cap and trade plan or a carbon tax where you can get incentivized for destroying the greenhouse gas uh interestingly in the netherlands there are a lot of brick factories that use uh, sediment because you know so much of their land is below sea level all of Europe is just eroding into them. So all their uh, canals and, and lakes and stuff have sedimentation issues, but there's a bunch of small brick factories that make brick from that because they get some sort of government incentive to do so. All right. I have a couple of brick questions actually, and this might be a good chance to, to voice them. So, um, <clears throat> Jeff Schrag asks, if you can collect the methane for energy, could you not also, oh, excuse me, that's, that, that's not the right brick question. That's coming up later. Jeff Schrag asks, do you think that your brick processes could be extended to sequester sort of nasty chemicals from burning urban waste, such as dioxins, forons, lead, mercury, et cetera? And he notes that that's probably not what you want to put on uh, your grandmother's bathroom floor. Um, similarly, uh, Reza Hadayat asks if you've conducted any durability evaluations for bricks for kind of outdoor use, um, because they're working actively at mines on durability aspects of geopolymerized tailings, and they'd like to, um, they'd like to talk more about that. Nice. One thing I really miss about academia is hearing words like ge geopolymerized. Um, uh, so for the other toxin sequestration, uh, I have not thought about it. We would be, because there's so much energy available, I'm interested in bolting on anything that's beneficial that could pay for itself in one way or another. So we might have a profitable tile factory and, but then also divert some of that energy to like atmospheric CO2 capture, which will never pay for itself, but, but we could probably get grants to do it. So for something like um, dioxins and lead, I have no idea. They're not, the, there's not normal scrubber chemistry going on in the, in, in the clay geology. So I'm gonna say no, but my email's here and go ahead and follow up with me because I'm, I'm, I'm interested. If you send me some, some links or something, I can be more intelligent. Um, then the, uh, and, and sorry, what was the second? Oh, durability. The, yes, our, we have done third party durability tests on the pavers, which there's a place called the National Brick Research Center, which is an excellent resource, should you find yourself in my shoes. And they do, there's various tests, right? They're, and they're all ASTM standards. So the only one we've done so far is ASTM C902, which is the standard for 
pavers for sidewalks, driveways, and patios. So that's a couple different types of strength test. That's a freeze-thaw durability test. And it's a, does it maintain friction after you like rub a rubber mallet on it many times? So, um, so yeah, so those pass that. And then we followed up that success with doing absolutely no quality assurance or quality control. Uh, but we didn't change our recipe. So we need, we really need to implement something where we say, okay, is this going to be, how do we know that what we're selling is the same as what we, um, what we tested and, you know, we'll be pulling from different parts of the reservoir is going to give us slightly different chemistry. And that's, that's certainly a concern, but I do, um, I'd be happy to talk about the various testing methods. If that's something that you're interested in, there's my email. Um, and I encourage you, if you want to talk about testing methods to email him, because I am going to use um, my prerogative to point us towards a big picture question that I have wanted to ask since the beginning of your talk. Um, and that question is, what does it mean to you uh, to approach climate change as a problem we can fix, which is something you said earlier on, versus a problem we need to just live with? Right. And does that orientation to climate change inform the kinds of decisions you're making as a entrepreneur um, and as a um, as a person who's doing something to make change in the world? And if so, how? Like, what does this mean? Yeah, that's that's a great question. Like, I don't. I don't think it's all fix. Like, like I don't think we're getting. I don't think we're going to be below one degree Celsius. I don't think we're going to be below 1.5 degrees Celsius, but I do. So, so we need to live with those impacts, which we're seeing are, are already bad and we're not even there yet. Um, so, so I do think we could fix it because the, there's no question that the technologies are there. Like we don't re from a technology standpoint, we don't need to burn fossil fuel anymore. That's just a, a political and economic inertia problem, which are fixable problems. And what I see, and you know, this was a slightly depressing talk, but what I, what I see my role a little bit as an entrepreneur is to say, hey, this, like, look at what climate action looks like. Like, it's pretty cool. We've got a, a decline in coal economy out here, but we can do manufacturing and it still comports with some people's like definition of masculinity to be lifting heavy things. And so, so we can get inspiration from all across the political spectrum because of the win-win nature of some of this stuff. And then I try not to get carried away because it's not solving the whole problem, even the small subset of problems that, that I've identified for myself. Um, but the optimistic version of the talk is let's go, let's go do this sort of thing over and over because just doing it is good for the community today and it's going to be good for the world later. Does that answer your question? You know, it definitely does. Um, I think that um, I think that uh, Dr. Jessica Smith, who is the director of the Humanitarian Engineering and Science Program, um, would like to ask her own question um, that might kind of build off that. I don't know. So uh, let's see. <laughs> thank you for your talk. Uh, I want to ask you a, a kind of a large level question about something a colleague of ours calls omnibenevolence. Her name is Marie Stetler Klein and she's going to be a postdoc and she identifies in, in people trained as engineers this desire to create benefit for everyone, for the environment. Um, for people and, and create economic value at the same time. And mm -hmm. 
I, I want to tie this back to your beginning comment about the cult of the entrepreneur. Um, and, and I see this idea of omnibenevolence a lot in the corporate world um, when you look at social responsibility programs. And I think one of the things we try to do in humanitarian engineering is show that there are inherent trade-offs and that you can't create good for all people and all environments all of the time. Mm -hmm. So I, I appreciated your comments about your own privilege, but I'm also wondering, what, what do you think about this idea of omnibenevolence? Is it important for being an entrepreneur to market your work? And what trade-offs do you have to manage kind of in, in your work? Yeah, that, that's a great question. And I think I, I think I am, am very seduced by the idea of omnibenevolence, uh, even though I recognize that it's that it's not the thing. So for example, the grant we got from CDPHE was to take uh, glass out of the recycling stream and and mix it into the bricks uh, because in a glass recycler they crush it right and they sell like the dime sized chips and i'll circle back to your question specifically but they, they can sell each size fraction for for a different use and then there's just this dust that's like flour and it like floats in the air and it's terrible but like actually you can add that to bricks and it lowers the porosity and it's another win win so i have to go like find these things because that's how i get funding is to be like look there's another win-win here and uh and now we're doing the climate and the reservoir and the glass and the jobs and you know even though obviously the glass and the reservoir are in direct tension because there's only a certain volume that we're selling so um so the, the so you know Trade-offs are we're looking, we're taking one atmospheric pollutant and we're putting out other atmospheric pollutants. The reservoir, I mean, should we be farming in the semi-desert west the way we are? And like, is the, you know, is just making some more, you know, the highest and best use of that water is probably sending it all the way to Mexico and, and like having a restored delta, right? So we're not, we're playing into a system that's not benevolent and, and we're benefiting that system. Um, the, you know, obviously we gotta be careful about uh, turbidity and the impact on the streams as we, as we get the sediment. Um, what a, I, I feel like that was a multi-part question. Would you bring me back to course? No, that, that was great. I think omnibenevolence is super seductive and it exists in lots of different domains. And so I think it's useful to hear you talk about the actual trade-offs that people have to make because those are really difficult decisions. Yeah, thanks. Yeah, thanks for the question. Very, very interesting. So I want to ask one more question <clears throat> um, so you can and then invite you to pull together some thoughts if you want to leave us with anything specific, Chris. Um, but my final question is going to come to you from um, Dr. John Hausdorfer, who is, um, as you know, uh, involved in the, the MEM side of our partnership. And he, he notes, and I think I, I actually share this sentiment, that we love to talk about um, you know, new possibilities for sustainability transitions. And your work is something that he says that he talks about often, and it's gonna be something that I talk about too. Um, but you, know, you are in a position where you're having to talk about this work in a lot of different ways, right? You have to, you have to play the alarmist, you have to play up this thing, play up that thing. That's part of what getting a business off the ground is, right? But we, you know, we in academia, like we want to get it right and be kind of true to some of the, the spirit of the, the project that you see. Um, so what do you find that people might misrepresent about Delta Brick when you hear the, them just discuss it? And what do you think are most important things that, that you think are like core values or core, um, core topics, core issues with, with um, Delta Brick and Climate Company? Yeah, well, 
this one is entirely my own fault because we realized that there's really no market for bricks. So we're mostly selling tile. And so occasionally people are like, whoa, you sell, you have tile? And I'm like, yeah, like come buy some. Because um, no, nobody wants brick, which is funny. Um, the, that's a misrepresentation. There's sort, of a, there's sort of a rumor mill. Like right now there's a barge out in the reservoir because it's doing maintenance work on the outlets again, six years later. And people are like, well, Chris, is that your bar? Are you, are you dredging? And I'm like, I wish I was dredging. No, I'm still trying to get like my sand and gravel mining permit. Um, so that's, uh, yeah, people, people think I'm farther along than I am or doing a different thing than I am or did I stop entirely? Like what happened? So the, that, and that's just like a, a marketing and communications issue. Um, what was the rest of your question? I've been rambling. I guess um, we're also wondering, I think particularly because we're interested in um, just transitions, um, sustainability, humanitarian engineering and science. Um, what do these things mean for, for Delta Brick or how might Delta Brick um, and climate company, whether or not it makes, it sells bricks or whether it sells tiles, sort of carry these values um, forward? Like how, how do you want people to, to understand and talk about the work you're doing? Um, yeah. And if you wanna like for, for extra points, for extra credit points, if I may be a professor about it, um, if you can address kind of how you think about your humanitarian and science, um, engineering and science work, probably humanitarian science work, given that is in fact what your degree is in. Yeah. Um, and that you've been a practicing science scientist. If you want to wrap it up and tell us kind of how you think about that, that would, we just, we'd just be so excited. I, well, I will say I am a pretty poor engineer, but I have to do engineering at times and it's embarrassing. The, the so we have, I, I don't know if they're values or goals, but the, but we, we wrote them out one time as, as like a team exercise. And then uh, I, have a, I have like a management coach who helps me with these things. And, and he took one from the bottom and he said, that needs to be up, up the top. And it's healthy profits right at the top because we don't get to keep doing the other three, which are good jobs, meaningful impact on greenhouse gases and meaningful impact on water storage. Um, so that's that's the four and those good jobs are right there because of a just transition mindset and also i want a good job for myself um all of you out there it's it's a rough world especially whenever you're going to graduate um so the yeah so so one yeah good, good jobs meaningful climate action meaningful irrigation resilience action that's those are the three things we're really focusing on and then profits being at the top to enable the others so that's the the humanitarian stuff is the jobs and is the people that are doing it uh, but it's also all the stakeholders and and hopefully the positively impacted everyone else's Positively impacted everyone else's. I kind of like that. To be um, omnipotent about it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, 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 right? Um, thank you so much, Dr. Kasky, for, for sharing your time and your reflections and being just so forthright about your experiences moving uh, through this, this business world, developing this uh, product. Um, I know that there were more questions that I couldn't quite get to, and I hope that folks have a chance to, to reach out to you. Would it be, you have your email address up here. I assume that you are welcoming of, of questions and contacts. Absolutely, please do. All right, then I will, um, I'm gonna close this colloquium and say thank you all for coming. Thank you for spending your evenings with us. We really appreciated it. And we, um, we had a great conversation and we look forward to more. Thank you so much, everyone. Good thank night. you all for coming in.